Oh, it is showtime. OK, today we're deriving the equations of change, as they're called. So all of both rheology and fluid mechanics is based on conservation of mass and momentum. And so we're reviewing fluid mechanics, so we're going to review conservation of mass and momentum. And when you studied this in undergrad fluid mechanics class, at least under me, you didn't derive it. We're deriving it now. The reason we didn't derive it in the undergrad fluid mechanics class is because it needs these vector and tensor theorems that we've been studying. And uh, you got to admit that wouldn't have been very welcome in your undergrad class. You would have thought that was a little bit too much. But now that you're more familiar with fluid mechanics, it's not too much. And so we'll go through the derivation because going through the derivation allows us to see what was assumed and allows us to sort through the final resulting equations to see which are the ones we need for rheology and how are they different from the ones we use for Newtonian fluid mechanics. So I've got this both on the PowerPoint slides and uh, we've been doing it live so that we can really see how it comes together. So last time I, I wrote this, which is not neat enough really for me to be so proud to show it again. Um, I'll, I'll start up with this again and we'll get to the microscopic mass balance. So let me start over with that and you, like I said, you should have this already, uh, some of it written down. We're going for the mass balance. So the big picture, mass is conserved. And this word is important. I'll point out where it truly became microscopic uh, when we get to that part of the derivation. So if mass is conserved, we choose some random volume, the pretty one that I have on the slides. It's enclosed by a surface S. I pick a little piece of volume, dV. And I write um, that the density at this point in space, so this density is a function of position and potentially a function of time. And I write what the density is of this little piece of space. I say, okay, the density times its volume, times this little piece of volume, that is mass in that little piece of volume. Mass per volume times volume gives mass. And then if I integrate that over the total big volume, this is the total big volume. I'll put little serifs on it so that we don't get it confused with um, little volumes. This is actually a little piece of big volume. This becomes the total mass in the big volume. And then if I take the derivative of that, I have the rate of change of the total mass in volume. So the rate of change of mass has to be equal to the net flow in, okay? Rate of increase equals net flow in. I'm going faster because we did this already last time. So all we did to get to this, you know, very abstract expression was use the definition of density and choose this little piece of volume, and the rest kind of falls out of the math. Mass per volume times volume is mass. Add all those masses up to get the total mass. Take the rate of change, and you've got the rate of increase. Now, net flow in, we're going to calculate in a, in a similar way. We need uh, the, the density again, so this is mass per volume, and now we need volume per time, net flow in, volume per time, through some piece of surface now with unit normal n, this is my little piece of surface, ds, and the net mass flow rate across that surface is what we discussed in the homework. It's the component of the velocity vector, so I really need to make sure that doesn't look like this v, and I made it I, almost identical by accident here. So let's make it more curvy. The velocity vector v, this is the velocity of fluid through this point in space. This is the component of the velocity that passes through ds. And so 
the cross-sectional area times the component of the, vo of the velocity that's through that is the volumetric flow rate through S. Mass per volume, volume per time, this is the mass per time through little piece ds. Add it up over all the pieces, that's the integral over the total surface s. And I get now the rate of uh, flow in. Actually, this is the net, net flow out. Do you know why it's net flow out instead of in? Because it's positive, yes, and because this is the outwardly pointing unit normal n. If it were the, it, when we chose it as the outwardly pointing unit normal n, we said out. If we had chosen the inwardly pointing, it would be in. So if this is net flow out, this is net flow in. So going over to the power point slides, this is what we've just done. The rate of increase is equal to the net flux. There's our volume enclosed by the surface S. The rate of increase is the integral of the density over uh, the volume, rate of change. The net flux in is rho n dot v ds. Uh, integrated and then that's the net flow out because this is the outwardly pointing unit normal so we add a minus sign to make it net flow in. So now we have an integral I'll recopy this I have d by dt integral over the volume v rho dv equals minus the integral over the surface s, rho n dot v ds. So we've done all the physics of the derivation and the rest is mathematics essentially. Okay, and we spent last lecture period talking about a couple of rules that are going to be handy now. Um, what we've written is the balance over an entire volume. So this volume that I picked over here is an arbitrary volume in space. It can be big, it can be small. Okay? We were trying to derive a mass balance over the smallest possible volume in space, the microscopic mass balance, the balance over a microscopic piece of space. So I want to get rid of the integral over this total volume. I want to be able to talk about as this volume shrinks down to be nothing, a microscopic volume. So this expression that I have over here uh, is not quite there yet because of all these integrals. I'd like to get, to frankly get rid of the integrals. And that's a, tr that's a tricky problem. It's a tricky problem because some things are true. The integral of this equals the integral of that without the integrands themselves being equal. But the integrals, the sum of all the items that you integrate over, that is equal to the other sum. It doesn't have to be the case that the individual items are equal. So, for instance, let me put this on a different piece of paper. If I said the integral of sine of x between 0 and pi was 0, that would be true. Uh, excuse me, 0 and 2 pi, you have this area, this area, and when you integrate over that total distance, uh, you get 0. It's not true, however, that sine of x is equal to 0, right? That's absolutely not true. So we can't just take this relationship and say, well, these integrals are equal, therefore what's inside should be equal. So we've got a little bit of a problem. Let's work on it a little bit and we'll see how we can get to a microscopic result. Let's start with the easy one. Let's use Leibniz rule. Leibniz rule said 
that the derivative of an integral was equal to the integral of the partial derivative of the integrand. So we can just bring this d by dt inside and make it a partial derivative. So this is the triple integral over the volume is equal to partial rho partial t dv. Now the other useful formula that we need is the divergence theorem, which I didn't bring out. I'll grab it quickly here. On lecture seven. There we go. The Gauss divergence theorem. This one is going to be very helpful to us now because it, we've got a volume integral on the left and a surface integral on the right. And we can use this equation to turn the vo this, this surface integral into a volume integral with the uh, Gauss divergence theorem. So our left hand side is integral over volume. Let's make our right hand side an integral over volume. And the divergence theorem says It says if I have n dot of vector quantity integrated over a surface, that's equal to the gradient of that same vector quantity integrated over a volume. So as with everything really in mathematics, we just have to make these things look like each other. So we need to make this look like this. So what's B? Rho V. So rho is just a scalar. You see how all that talk about associative and distributed, all that comes back again. This rho can go anywhere. So I'm going to sneak it in between the n and the dot. And then it looks like n dot rho V, which is B. And so therefore, this turns into the integral of the gradient dot rho V dv. So minus the integral over the surface of rho n dot v ds is equal to minus the volume integral of grad dot rho v dv by the divergence theorem. And you can see we have a product rule here as well. Okay, so we'll we'll have to deal with that at some point, but that's cool. I mean, this is this density is a function of position, and so is the velocity. But anyway, uh, we're just following the divergence theorem just now. Okay, so let's put the two parts together. The left hand side after Leibniz was the volume integral of d rho dt dv equals minus the volume integral of grad dot rho v dv. So this little v, I'm trying to make it look like a velocity, and this is big v here. Well, they're both integrals over the same volume. I can combine them. This is the integral over v of partial rho with respect to t plus del dot rho v, all of that, dv capital V. Yep. 
top equation uh -huh. for this middle equation. Uh huh. Okay. Are your V's supposed to be switching? Which ones have hats and which ones don't? Well, I'm just not writing very smoothly. This one is velocity. Okay. This one is velocity. And this one is velocity. Well, the volume integral also. That is still meant to be the capital V. Okay. Thank you. All of these are all these integrals are the capital V. And all these n dot v's, this came from the volumetric flow rate. That's a little v. OK. So we're almost done. This final step, if I go back and I, I look at this idea of the sine again, right? We have an expression that integrates to 0, just like the integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine of x integrates to 0. And uh, I, we've already established that the logic doesn't work for us. If we have an integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine of x, it doesn't mean sine of x is everywhere is 0. It just means that sometimes it may be positive, sometimes it may be negative, and overall it integrates to 0. This integral, though, is a little different. This integral is an integral over an arbitrary volume v. Okay, looking up here, we picked this volume v randomly in space. Big, little, anything. It didn't matter. As long as we just wrote our balance on the same volume, it didn't matter. If we tried that on sine of x, it wouldn't work. We can't pick an arbitrary interval and say the integral of sine of x will be 0, any arbitrary interval at all. It's certainly not true, OK? But for this integrand, I can pick an arbitrary interval, an arbitrary volume. And there is, in fact, only one function that you can integrate over an arbitrary interval and always get 0 and that's 0. Okay? So in this case, because we're integrating over an arbitrary volume, it's like integrating sine from any two limits. And the only function we can integrate over any two limits at all and always get 0 is the 0 function. Okay? Does that make sense? So that means that what's inside here must be 0 always. Because the volume is arbitrary. The integrand, so that's what's inside the integral, must be everywhere zero. So that means rho partial with respect to t plus del dot rho v has to be equal 0. And that's the microscopic mass balance. It's true everywhere. And we can integrate it over any arbitrary volume we like, and it'll be true there, too. Okay, this is a very powerful balance. It's true everywhere in our flow. And this is the continuity equation. And it's written in Gibbs notation, which we know how to handle. We can expand this and turn it into different versions. Let's try that. All we have to do is expand this product rule in Einstein notation, and we'll see another form of the continuity equation. So let me copy that onto a new sheet. So 
starting with d rho dt plus del dot rho v equals zero. So capital V is history now, right? This is the microscopic balance, true at any point. We can write this in Einstein notation. So the del operator is d by dx p e p dot rho, and then v is v, let's say, k e k. The del operator operates on everything to the right. We only ever do these kind of calculations in cylindrical, excuse me, in Cartesian coordinates. So these don't change with space, and we can carry out the dot product. P becomes K. But we're left with this product to carry out. So copying d rho dt plus d by dx, P becomes K, rho vk equals 0. Now we use the product rule. The first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. So this is like the kind of exercise I might have asked in homework one or two. And we can now write it back in Gibbs notation if we can figure out what these things might be in Gibbs notation. Do you have a guess for me? Do you know what this is in Gibbs notation? Is it a vector, a scalar, or a tensor for starters? Where's the E? Huh? No E's, right? has to be a scalar. Makes sense, right? Look at this. This is just density. That's a scalar. Everything in the equation better be a scalar. So this is a scalar. So it's got the vector v in it, so something must have dotted with the v to get rid of the unit vector. So what dotted with the v? Del. del? Could be. Could be del dot v. Could it be v dot del? What would v dot del be? Would that be a scalar? It would be a, but it would be an operator, because the del's on the right-hand side. v dot del. But anyway, we could take guesses and then go to Einstein and try it out. So we're going to try del dot v for this one. What about this one? It's a scalar again. What about just this quantity, d rho dx k? It can't be del dot rho. Why? You can't dot a scalar. You can't dot a scalar. Right? There's no E with rho, so that wouldn't work. So it can't be del dot rho, so what could it be? It could be rho next to del without a dot. Or it could be del next to rho without a dot, the gradient of the, of the density. So this could be del rho. Okay. And then here's a V. Something had to be dot. Del rho would be a vector. If we dotted V with it or dotted it with V, those are two possibilities as well. So this is the kind of mental gymnastics, I guess, you have to go through to go backwards. Let's try some things. Let's try for this one, let's try del dot v. All right? So del dot v would be d by dx m e m dot v s e s, let's say, delta m s, m becomes s. d by d x s v s. 
Is that the same as this? Same thing, right? It's the summation s equal 1 to 3 of dv s dx s. This is the summation 1 to 3 of dv k dx k. Same thing. So this is del dot v. We got that one right the first time. Now this one, we're going to see what is del rho. Del rho, d by dx n e n. Notice I don't make any effort to match the same indices. It's hopeless. I'm going to be dotting things. Some of the indices are going to go away. Don't, don't try. It's a waste. But be able to do that question I just did. Are these things the same thing? Well, k is arbitrary. So what if I had picked s instead? Oh, it's the same thing. Right? You have to be able to identify that this is the same thing as this. So I just picked n, I put the row there, and so this is just d rho dx n e n. Right, so looking at this, we, there's a d rho dx k. This is a vector. This is a scalar. This k matches with that v. How does that happen? How do you get a situation where this component matches with this one? A dot product, right? So maybe it's v dot rho, v dot del rho, or maybe it's del rho dot v. Okay? They're vectors, so it actually doesn't matter because vector dot product commutes. But we could try both of them if you didn't, if that didn't convince you. Let's try v dot del rho. We've got del rho already. I can just copy that. And v is just, I don't know, v f e f. And there's a dot. Delta f n. f becomes n. f becomes n means d rho dx n, no e's left over. Are these the same thing? Right? Because, Juan, why are they the same thing? The, the letter is arbitrary, so. Right? So this could just have well been n, right? The subscript on the v matches the subscript on the, d, the derivative in the bottom. The subscript on the v matches the bottom. If we had done del rho dot v, how would it have been different? Well, it would just be a different letter. You know, different letters we would have picked would have come out exactly the same, right? There's going to be one E for the del rho part, one E for the V. They're going to dot together. It's going to come out like this, same answer. And that's comforting because we said all along that vectors commute. This is a vector. This is a vector. Vector dot product commutes. Tensor dot product does not commute. Vector dot product does commute. So put it all together. We started with the continuity equation was partial rho with respect to t plus del dot rho v equals zero. And we now have proven that d rho dt is also equal to uh, del dot v plus v dot del rho equals zero. Same thing. Notice that this del dot rho v comes out to almost look like the product rule. The first, oh, see, I forgot a rho here. The first times the derivative of the second 
plus the second times the derivative of the first. It kind of works. But if I had just said that off the top of my head, you would have said, how, how did she know that? Where did that come from? Well, it comes from the calculation we just did very rigorously in Cartesian coordinates. When we get to a similar sort of um, uh, identity with tensors, there'll be different permutations that are possible to interpret as the first, the derivative of the second, the second derivative of the first. The one that's correct is the one that works out like this in Einstein notation. Okay, so let's summarize by going to the nice, nice slides. Oh, this is the next, uh, next slide already, lecture nine. Let's go to lecture eight. So this is what we did. We took the integral of the mass over the volume V and took the rate of change. We equate it to the net flow in. We then take both under the same integral sign, but since this volume V is arbitrary, since V is arbitrary, the integrand itself must go to zero, and that's the mass, microscopic mass balance. And we showed an alternate form of it that we can get by using Einstein notation. So here's the alternate form, uh, d rho dt plus rho del dot v plus v del rho dot del rho. And you can see also that the substantial derivative appears. These two terms form the substantial derivative. d function dt plus v dot del the function is the substantial derivative. And there's just this one other term there, equals zero. When the density is constant, this, it doesn't change with time. It doesn't change with space. If you expand this out, these are all spatial derivatives, and you just get del dot v equals zero, which you'll recognize when you write that out as something you've seen quite a bit in solving flow problems in fluid mechanics, the incompressible continuity equation. In this class, we'll always deal with incompressible fluids, so this is our version of the continuity equation. Now let's do the same tricks for momentum, okay? Momentum is a little trickier, uh, but the philosophy is exactly the same. But the momentum conservation equation is fundamentally F equals MA, Newton's law of, uh, of motion. So we started for the mass balance with mass is conserved. So we start with the momentum balance that momentum is conserved. And we just need to write these word terms. The rate of increase of momentum in V, the net flux of momentum into V, and the F equals MA part, the sum of the forces on V. Now, we ought to be able to do these strictly from looking at what we just finished. These two terms are just exactly the same as the terms in the mass balance, except with the word momentum there instead of the term mass. So let's try that. Okay, so rate of increase of momentum in V. I'll try to be clear on my V's this time. Now let me go back through my notes and see what exactly we did. I would like you to go back through your notes and see exactly how we did this for mass. It's a few pages back. Here it is. For mass, the rate of increase of mass with time was the integral of the, the density over the volume time derivative. So how will the same expression be different for momentum than for mass? What are the units of density? Mass per volume. So we need something with what units here? Momentum per volume. Okay, what has you, what's the definition of momentum? Momentum. 
it, right, right. Ma mass times velocity. Mass times velocity is momentum. Okay? So if this is mass per volume, what would momentum per volume be? If we're trying to get mass, we want mass times velocity per volume. And we have mass per volume. So what do we need? Does it make sense that it's a vector? Is momentum a vector? Yeah. Yes. So we're good. This combination is momentum per volume. And now we put it into this equation exactly the same. We write it for a little piece of volume. We integrate it over the volume itself. And then to get the rate of change, we take the time derivative. So it's exactly, exactly the same calculation, only we use momentum per volume instead of mass per volume. Now we'll do the same trick in terms of comparison um, with the second term, which was net flux of momentum into V. And I'm going to again compare to net flux of mass into V. Okay, here it is. Net flux of mass in was this term, which was volume per time times mass per volume, integrated over the whole surface through which it could pass, and then the minus sign because this was flow out and we wanted flow in. Okay, so again we want momentum per volume so that we can multiply it by volume per time. So in this equation it was mass per volume, volume per time. So now we want momentum per volume, volume per time. What's momentum per volume? What's momentum per volume? Same thing, rho v. Rho v. Same thing, rho v. So this term, momentum per volume, is rho v. What's volume per time? The entire thing. Entire thing. Same thing as before. The net, the, co the component of the velocity times the area is the volumetric flow through that little piece of area. So we just copy that down. N dot V dS integrated over the surface minus sign to turn it into net flow in. Is that a dot product in between or between? Where would a dot come from? Did we need it? In our minds, did we need it? No? Up here, we put a scalar quantity, the density there, which was mass per volume. Here, we put a vector quantity, rho v, which is the momentum per volume. You're right to be skeptical, because what just happened was a tensor appeared. You may not see the tensor yet, but we'll see it when we use the divergence theorem. Okay? So all we're doing is looking at the units and matching them up, and so far so good. We don't feel we've done anything wrong. This is a scalar. I can put parentheses if you like. N dot V is a scalar. This is a scalar. This is a vector. So scalar times vector times scalar times scalar is all vector. Okay? So we haven't done anything illegal. I haven't done anything funny. There have been no sleight of hands. All we did was write momentum per volume, volume per time. What is the divergence theorem? I have that here somewhere.
There's the divergence theorem from before. The divergence theorem says n dot sum property integrated over a surface is del dot that property integrated over a volume. What's the property now? It's got to be n dot v, right? Because it's got to be n dot something. And this is just a vector. This is a scalar, right? So I can move that scalar out in front. So I can go row v next to it. That's legal, right? I haven't done anything. I haven't made up a new rule. I just moved the n dot row out front and took the parentheses away. But the parentheses don't do anything. There's no del there or anything. And n just acts by dotting the unit vectors on n with the unit vectors on v. I haven't changed anything. So what's, what's b? It's, it's not n dot because the n dot is part of the divergence theorem. It's everything that gets dotted, rho v v. It's a dyad. It's a tensor. I still haven't done anything. It's kind of a new thing, but I haven't really done anything. All I've done is move this scalar, which I'm allowed to do, moved it out to the front just for nicety. I could have left it in the middle. It just looks a little awkward in the middle. I just moved it out to the front, totally legal, no tricks. But look at this. Just like in the derivation for linear vector function, a, a tensor thing has appeared tensor thing has appeared. And so according to the divergence theorem, we can change this surface integral into a volume integral. Okay, here's my divergence theorem. I have the integral over the surface S, n dot a property, now I know what that property is, integrated over S is equal to the volume integral of del dot that property dV. So this is equal to, the minus sign just comes along for the ride, the volume integral of del dot b dv. Okay, this is, this is big V, pointy big V, hopefully. This is curly little v, that's velocity. It's the momentum flux tensor, actually a tensor. And it's a big old interesting mess. Look, we can do this in Einstein notation now. Uh, it's a triple product. So we have to do maybe the first two together times the derivative of the second, second derivative of the first, and then we have to do that one in a product rule, first, second, second, first. It's a nice big mess, nice homework problem mess. Okay? But it, it all is something you can do. It's all something you can do. And now it's written under the same as the first term, it's the integral under this volume. And we're going to be able to bring them under the same uh, integral sign when we're done. So we're making good progress here. All right, so what were we trying to do? Let's see if we can still remember. The first term that we did, rate of increase of momentum, is the left-hand side of the momentum balance. We're done. Okay. The second one that we just finished was the net flux of momentum in. That's the second term in the momentum balance. Done. Okay. Two terms done. Last term, sum of the forces on V. So again, on these slides, here are the first two terms that we did. The rate of increase of momentum in V is the time rate of change of the integral over the volume. We use Leibniz rule. We get that derivative on the inside, which we haven't done yet. We can go back and quickly catch that up. We can use Leibniz rule here. Integral over the volume, capital V, partial with respect to time of rho V, D point V. Okay. So that is easy and done. So that one's done. And then the net flux of momentum in, we wrote as just 
momentum per volume, volume per time, and it spontaneously produced this dyad. Then we use the fact that it's n dot b equals del dot b, and we use the Gauss divergence theorem, and now we've got the second term. The third easy term is gravity. So the third group of terms is the sum of the forces on the volume. And they're going to be body forces and molecular or surface. And that's actually a fundamental statement. There are only two kinds of forces. There are forces that act on surfaces and forces that act by virtue of your volume, which are called body forces. Forces at a distance. Maybe you heard that term in freshman physics. Forces at a distance that act on a volume and forces that are contact forces. And so for fluid mechanics, there are body forces. The body force is gravity. That's the only one that we have. And the molecular force is, uh, and the surface force is, mo is molecular, which is pressure. And mo molecular stresses like viscosity. So these two are the hard part. We'll do the hard part next time. We'll do the easy one right now at the end of the lecture. Body forces are easy. F equals ma, right? So uh, the acceleration due to gravity is g. What's the mass on our wacky control volume? Rho. V, little piece of V, integrate it over the whole volume, and that's the force due to gravity. So that one truly is very easy. F equals ma, mass times acceleration. This is mass per volume times volume times acceleration. So we're good there. So that's summarized here. The force on the volume due to gravity is the integral of rho g dv. We don't need Leibniz rule. We don't need the divergence theorem. It's already correctly written as a volume integral. If we go back a slide or two, we've we finished this one. We finished this one. There are two forces here. We're half done with this one. Now let me give you a little tour of molecular forces in the last two minutes. As I say on this slide, molecular forces, that's the tough one. This is where the stress tensor is going to appear. And we have to define the stress tensor, and that's the thrust, that's the, at the very heart of rheology is the stress tensor. So we have all these, this flow going on, and we want to write the stress at a particular point after all, all of our equations that we've been writing, we've been saying, choose a point and the surface at that point, the flux through that point, we can write uh, fluxes through that point, we can write all kinds of things. Now we want to write a contact force on this little piece of surface, okay? How do we write that? Well, we need to know at this point right there, what is the state of stress at that point? So that we can relate it to the unit vector that defines this surface and then integrate it over the whole surface. It's a surface contact force. So we're looking for a way to write all the contact forces in this space at this point as a function of position. There's all these other points that we're going to have to write so that we can then integrate it over the whole surface. And 
this is a problem. This is a problem because for Newtonian fluids, it's one thing, and for non-Newtonian fluids, it's something else. So we're going to spend uh, some time thinking about this. We're going to talk next time about the kinds of things that bring about these forces, and then we're going to get down and dirty about the forces at a point so that we can then get to the final expression where the stress tensor will somehow come into this momentum balance and show up in our final equation. Okay, so we'll do that next time on Friday.